Welcome to the Love Lab Podcast, a safe place to get real about sex. Whether you're a man, woman, single, or couple, this is the show for you. We are your hosts, Kevin Anthony and Celine Remy, and we are here to guide you to go from good to amazing in the bedroom and beyond. All right, welcome back to the Love Lab Podcast. This is episode 154, and it's titled, What to Do When You Can't orgasm. So this episode is going to be for both men and women. Interestingly enough, when people think about not being able to orgasm, they generally think about women. That's usually what comes up. You're like, oh yeah, you're talking about women. But actually this is a common problem for men too and becoming more common every year. And we'll talk about why that is when we get into the things that are causing that. So we're going to talk about the different types of orgasmic dysfunction. We're going to talk about what causes it. And then, of course, because we always like to leave you with solutions, we're going to cover a list, a pretty good list of things that you can do if you are having trouble orgasming. This doesn't replace any uh, medical advice and support that you can need, and it won't replace working with a therapist or a sex coach or anything like this if you really have a, a true issues, but it will help you know how to get started so you can start coming. Yeah, and so, you know, working with a professional is going to be one of the things on our list, but what, what you'll get as we go through the list is, What's the stuff that you can do Mm -hmm. and what's the stuff that you need outside help for? And that's going to be really important. Before we get started, let's give a big shout out to our sponsors, Power and Mastery. So if you want to join the secret club of men who are great in bed, then check out Power and Mastery at powerandmastery.com. It is the most complete sexual mastery training for men, whether you want to have harder erections, last longer, or increase your sexual skills, there is something for you at powerandmastery.com. All right, so let's get started and let's talk first about the four types of orgasmic dysfunction. I bet you didn't even know there were four. You're just like, I can't come and that's it, right? There are actually four, what well, they classify them in four different ways. And why that's important is because how you treat them depends on what kind of orgasmic dysfunction you have. I have to say, though, I have an issue with the word dysfunction because it kind of implies that something's broken and that you need to be fixed. And I don't really like this approach when people like, I can't come, like something must be wrong with me. And it's not always the case. Like this, there could be something underlying it. So I don't want to approach it from the place of like, oh, you're broken, something's wrong. It's more like, let's understand, like those categories can help understand things because some people can come by themselves, but not with a partner. Some people can come in different situations and not others. And that's where they would fall into those categories. Well, yeah. So, I mean, that's a good distinction. I agree with that. Um, You shouldn't think what's wrong with me or am I broken? But obviously an orgasm is a normal part of a healthy functioning body. And if you can't orgasm, then something is indeed wrong. What's wrong? Well, that all depends and we're going to get into that. But yeah, don't automatically assume there's something wrong with you, but there is something that needs to be fixed because you should, in a normal, healthy, functioning situation, be able to orgasm. Okay, so let's dive into our four types. So number one is the primary anorgasmia, which is a condition in which you've never had an orgasm. This, I'd say, is pretty rare. Most people have, at some point in their life, experienced an orgasm. I think it's more common for women than it is for men to be honest, because there are a few women who, if you've been wondering, have I had an orgasm? That probably means you haven't. <laughs> yeah, that, that is a sure sign. If you're like, well, I think maybe I have that. No, you haven't because you know when you have. <laughs> The second type is the secondary anorgasmia, which is a difficulty reaching orgasm, even though you've had one before. And that I would say is probably more common because uh, most people have experienced one, even just one, once in their life. (laughs) Well, yeah. And secondary is really saying difficulty reaching, which Mm -hmm. means you have them occasionally from time to time here or there, but it's definitely not a sure thing. And sometimes you struggle with it. I'm going to also mention something like 
just because you're reading an erotic novel or watching porn and people come in five minutes doesn't mean that because you take 45 minutes, you're not normal. It's very normal. And we'll come back to that. You know, when you're like difficulty reaching orgasm, it takes me 15 minutes or 20 minutes. Hey, I've got news for you. It's a normal thing to need some time. Well, two things. First of all, it's 100% normal for, for women. <laughs> every study they've ever done on it, and I swear we talk about this in practically every show. But yeah, it takes women 20 to 30 minutes generally to orgasm. And honestly, I'd say in some cases, m- even more like 40 or 45 minutes. Mm-hmm. That That's totally normal. Um, so, you know, the, if you're going, wow, you know, 15 minutes, remember that in a movie, they got basically two hours to cram an entire story into a movie. And, you know, these things are designed specifically to, you know, turn you on, stimulate you, whatever. They are not necessarily reflecting reality in any way, shape or form. Yeah, but that sometimes is what some people use as their framework of like what's normal. And that's not a good place to judge yourself or compare mm-hmm. yourself with. Well, absolutely. So I'm just going to say this right now. <laughs> maybe, maybe uh, I feel like we shouldn't have to say it, but I will because apparently we do, which is that if you're comparing yourselves to magazines or television or movies or books or any of this stuff, stop it. Stop it right now. It is fantasy. Even when they're telling you that these things are real, it is fantasy. You are setting yourself up for failure and depression if you constantly compare yourself to things that are not real. All right, let's talk about our third uh, type of orgasmic dysfunction, which is called situational anorgasmia. It is the most common type of orgasmic dysfunction. It occurs when you can only orgasm during specific situations, such as during oral sex or masturbation or manual stimulation or penetration or whatever that is. But I think that's really what I hear most, especially when it comes to women where they feel like they can masturbate and have a clitoral orgasm during their masturbation. But when it comes to penetration sex, it doesn't translate and they are unable to experience an orgasm or that they can't have a vaginal orgasm and somehow it's just not as good. You know, I would say like orgasms are orgasms and we can train your body together. If you can get to one, you can get to the other. It's just that the wirings uh, are just needing to be realigned. Yeah. And, you know, actually this is probably the most common one we see with men too. And while we see much fewer men complaining that they can't orgasm, we do, we do come across them and, you will often hear from them, well, you know, it's okay when I masturbate, but then when I go to, you know, make love with my partner and we'll get into the reasons why that are, but there's all kinds of things about performance pressure and things that, that factor in there, which we'll talk about when we get to the reasons why. But yeah, I would say that in both cases, men and women, that's probably what we see the most. And then our fourth type is the general anorgasmia, which is the inability to achieve orgasm under any circumstances, even when you're highly aroused and sexual stimulation is sufficient. That's a bummer. Yeah, that, that, I mean, we don't know, but that likely has something to do with medical conditions, Mm -hmm. most likely. Which is a great segue into the reasons why you don't orgasm. And there are actually quite a lot of them uh you know so this list mostly comes from healthline but then we added a bunch of stuff to it too so but i just want to say that because a lot of it does come from there and you know it's often difficult to determine the underlying cause especially because there are so many possibilities (laughs) so we're just going to go through the list here and what you'll notice is like, it, let's say you're listening and you're a person who is having difficulty. You might hit like several of these things that we say and go, oh yeah, that's me. Oh yeah, that too. And the reason why that is, is because it could be any one of these or it could be a combination of these things as well. So it's important to kind of listen to each one and think about, okay, is that something that is a factor here or not? And really actually give it some thought. And understand too that while we are a physical body, there are so much more around 
what make us whole in our humanity, like the emotional side, the mental side, the physical side, the spiritual side too. All of this, we are interconnected. And it's not like you've got your sex on this side and then uh, you the head, I don't know, the other part of your body over there on the other side, and it's all like disconnected. If you want to be congruent and align, all of these aspects of you beings need to be congruent and aligned. And if there is an issue in one of those, even if it's emotional, we're like, how is that connected? Because I'm not having an emotional orgasm. I'm having a physical orgasm. Well, it can play a role as you can see. All right. So first one on the list is older age. Notice they say older age. They don't specifically say what old age. (laughs) I wonder too, if it's because in most people's minds, when they think about getting older, they're thinking it's going to be downhill from there on. And a lot of it, when it comes to the placebo effect and the idea of what you put in your head of like getting older means less fun. I think it's really important that you seek good role models. I know plenty of older people who have great sex, who feel good in their body and continue being physical and experience pleasure. And I can look for plenty. I don't even have to look that hard because I'd say that most of the messages out there in the media are from like, oh, this is what, how horrible it's going to be when you get older. So it's important to choose good role model and create the reality that you want and don't just buy into something like this. We got a, we got a neighbor who's in his mid eighties and he's still chasing the ladies around. Mm -hmm. But so that brings me to a point about older age is that most of the issues when we're talking about older age have to do with health issues. So in his case, he's very fit. He runs with his dog every day up a hill. (laughs) Mm -hmm. like so you know a lot of it's going to be tied to uh the health of your body so so speaking of health if you can't orgasm there could be something deeper that needs to be ruled out things like diabetes stroke multiple sclerosis there are some medical issues and conditions that could get in the way and that needs to be checked out first absolutely so we have as you said diabetes strokes multiple sclerosis you have history of gynecological surgery such as hysterectomy um, prostate issues Mm -hmm. so these are all physical things that uh, could affect your ability to achieve an orgasm. So, and we'll talk about this when we get to how do you solve these problems. But if, if your issue is related to something like that, then you're going to have to address the underlying physical condition first. There is something called delayed ejaculation syndrome, which affects about 4% of men. And it's really if for like six months, a man has not been able to come for like 30 minutes of penetrative sex and just can't get there. That's what determines, but really they don't really know much more about that. And I feel like it could be linked a lot to the use of certain medication. And that's probably why. Yeah. So, you know, when you added that to the list, I was like, you know, I don't actually know much about delayed ejaculation syndrome. So I just want to do a little research on it and, and find out more. And when I was doing that, I was on some sites like the Mayo Clinic, you know, kind of your big kind of mainstream medical sites. And I was just curious, like, what do they say about it? And really... (laughs) It seems like delayed ejaculation syndrome is the official medical term that they give to when a man can't ejaculate. And when you read the list of reasons why, it's basically all the other things that we've talked about and we'll be adding as we go down this list. So it's it's a lot of the same things. It's the health issues, it's the medications, it's all that stuff. So speaking of medication, I want to talk about that because there are very, very common side effects from uh, taking what's called uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or SSRIs or also known as antidepressants. Are you going to talk about the big pink elephant in the corner of the room that we're not allowed to say ever? Yes. So many people are on antidepressants because let's face it, it's hard to live in this world. It's a difficult world at times. And antidepressant can really mess up your uh, hormones, your ability to feel your body, uh, a lot of things, even like um, beta blockers also can feel, can stop how you feel your hormones, anything that will play on that level of the hormones. Yeah. So 
this is, you know, I was slightly joking when you started talking about this, and yet I'm not, because this is a well known side effect. It's written, like if you open the insert in your antidepressant thing, it's, I'm guarantee you it's listed there. At least it used to be, unless they stripped it out of there. And, you know, I, I didn't think about it when we were writing this show, but I should have looked up the stats for the percentage of Americans that are on antidepressants, because the last time I looked that up, it was shockingly high, shockingly high. Many of you listening are probably on antidepressants. Therefore, it's important for you to know how much this could be potentially affecting you. So according to Gail Saltz, MD and Associate Professor of Psychiatry at New York Presbyterian Hospital, Wheel Cornell School of Medicine, and author of The Ripple Effect, How Better Sex Can Lead to a Better Life, she says, the most notorious medications for difficulty having orgasm and lowering libido are serotonin reuptable inhibitors, serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, and tricyclics antidepressants. Basically, she just covered it with all those fancy scientific words. All your main, you know, uh, antidepressants fill in the, the commercial name that they do in the advertisements, but that pretty much covers all of them. So coming from her, she's calling it the most notorious medication. It's like, yeah, everybody knows that. It's one of the first things. If you're really having trouble orgasming, you have to look at it. You just have to. Yeah. Let's look at a few other things here that could impact your ability to orgasm. So your cultural or religious beliefs for sure can affect you. And we'll come back to that, to the mind, because again, it's like the power of our minds, feeling shy. So it's more when you tend to be held back and having guilt about enjoying sexual activity. Again, this is all kind of this mental trip because our biggest sex organ is located between our ears. It's our brain. So any time we're messing with medication to make our brain function differently or we are like just you know creating silly stories in our head it will affect our body's response of course things like sexual abuse and again it has more to do with the trauma that hasn't yet been processed and that's in the way so that would be that hey did, did you know that uh, history of sexual abuse, guilt about enjoying sex activity and shyness could all be subcategories under cultural and religious beliefs. They oh, can. Did I just say that out loud? <laughs> yes, they can. This is kind of why we lump them together. I'm going somewhat fast because they kind of all go together. Um, we've already talked about the the mental health condition because if you're an antidepressant, that means you have a mental health condition of like depression or anxiety, uh, which is huge and will affect and stress because stress is it's the silent killer. It's crazy. You don't notice stress until it's too late. Stress produces a lot of cortisol. The cortisol level will affect how your hormones are being produced. If your hormones are out of whack, you can't have as much libido. Sometimes it can have an effect with how you orgasm. So it's kind of this like vicious cycle that you can get stuck in. And let's talk about a couple more here, which are the self-esteem. If you have poor self-esteem, again, it's about your own mental uh, game that you're playing. And the biggie here in the room, the relationship issues, such as unresolved conflicts, lack of trust. It could be like built up resentment. It's just like, you know, the stuff that you've tried to shove under the rug. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is actually an important one. This is one that we work with a lot in mm -hmm. the work that we do. And it's one I think that, that largely goes unnoticed. You know, you use different terms, like you'll say the wisdom of the penis mm -hmm. or the wisdom of the vagina or, or things like that. You know, it, our bodies tell us things all the time if we're willing to listen. So, you know, rarely does anything just pop up out of nowhere. You're like, wow, it just suddenly happened. <laughs> Generally, there are signs there if you know what to look for and if you're paying attention. And so, you know, relationship issues, it's a big one. These things tend to be under the surface and we may not see them until there's a physical problem. And this is 
perfect segue into our sponsor ad because if that's you and you are in a committed relationship and you're stuck in a rut you're going through the motion and you're not connecting the way you used to maybe you feel more like roommates maybe your sex life is not what it used to maybe you don't have fun or spontaneity and you kind of like are in a rut and you don't want to be living this life of average then kevin and i would like to invite you to join us to a highly sexed power couple platinum program if you give us 90 days, we will help you bring the passion back between the sheets and be synced up sexually so that you can thrive with more purpose and passion in life. So for more about this wonderful program, go to CelineRemy.com forward slash passion. We can't wait to talk to you and support you on this journey. You know, we so did not do that transition on purpose, but boy, was that perfect. <laughs> it is perfect. If you want to come, go to CelineRemy.com forward slash passion. <laughs> If you want to come, come see us. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's talk about a couple of things before we get into our step-by-step, because -step, I really want to give the step-by-step. -step. We have a lot of steps. I want to give it enough time. But before we get into those steps, let's talk about how orgasm and ejaculation are two different things. What? 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 Well, if you are familiar with the Love Lab podcast and you've been here with us for a while, you've heard us say that already on many shows. But your orgasms and your ejaculation are two different things and they can be separated. So just because you can't come, meaning ejaculate, doesn't mean you can't have an orgasm. So for a lot of men who come to have uh, help from us, that's the big reframe that we start to give them. We always ask like, hey, if you could have orgasm, independently of whether or not you ejaculated, would that feel good and be fulfilling and satisfying? And most of them are like, yeah, it actually would. And so it takes away the whole pressure that you must come and then you start to learn to move sexual energy into your body and that becomes so much more pleasurable, the lovemaking. So when you're a guy and you can't come, there are so many ways that you can learn to separate the ejaculation and still feel an orgasm and still feel orgasmic bliss and still be fulfilled. Yeah. You know, what's interesting is a lot of guys think that it's the physical ejaculation that is giving them all the sensations. And so I've had this conversation with men before where they're like, yeah, but if I don't ejaculate, then I'm not going to have all this, you know, sensation and stuff like that. It's actually not true. While there is some sensation that comes from the physical act of ejaculating, most of what you experience is not tied to the ejaculation at all. Mm. Mm -hmm. I also want to talk about the very first step and element to have in place when you want to have an orgasm and or if you want to support your partner in having an orgasm. Most people focus on that arousal part on like, what's the trick? What can I touch? What can I stimulate? And that arousal. But the first step is to create safety because without safety, you can't surrender. If you can't surrender, it's going to be really hard to being able to experience an orgasm. There is a correlation, especially for women, between your ability to surrender and let go and your ability to experience orgasms. So if you don't feel like you're safe and you can't surrender, you can't get there. If you don't, if you feel too stressed out, again, stress will put you into the fight, flight, fight, flight. <laughs> We got it. Freeze, freeze. That's that last one you're going for. <laughs> well, I can do this. If you are into that, you are not feeling safe. So we got to bring your body into your parasympathetic nervous system rather than the sympathetic nervous system. Really important. And for some, the arousal part never comes in. For some women, the arousal part comes after kind of the stimulation. You think that, oh, arousal, then we get to like that sexual like connection. And sometimes for women, it is reversed. Now we need to have some stimulation to finally feel the arousal and the excitement. So if we're waiting for the excitement, for something to happen, we can be waiting forever because it may never happen if you are reversed. But if we bypass that, create that safety element and understand that arousal will come and it's on time, then we can get somewhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So let's dive into our sort of step by step. It's not necessarily you have to do step one through step 15. Some steps will apply to you and some steps may not apply to you. But we're going to go down the list of things that can help you solve this problem. 
So number one, fix any physical issues or disorders. So that kind of goes without saying, right? We started in the beginning talking about how certain health conditions can cause this problem. If you have one of those health conditions, really step one has to be resolving that. It just has to be. You're not going to get anywhere if you don't, right? So that might mean working with a doctor, uh, changing lifestyle habits, things like that. You're going to have to make some big changes. And you know, that's hard for a lot of people to do. They say, well, that sounds like a lot of work or well, you know, I, I like eating my donuts and drinking my coffee or whatever it is, you know? And then you just have to ask yourself, how much do you want it? How important is this to you? Would you rather keep eating your donuts or would you rather have some really great fucking sex and orgasms? Number two, treat any underlying medical conditions, which is similar to number one, uh, but again, like seeking some help. And number three, switch antidepressant medications. That's not something you do on your own. It's something you do with your doctor, but change those medications. Yeah, you know, those the one and two sound a lot alike. I just want to quickly make a distinction is that one, there are things that are very obviously the cause, mm -hmm. right? Physical things. And another one are things that may seem unrelated, but that are still physical issues that would need to be solved. Mm. That, that's why we have two different things there. And of course, you know, when it comes to the antidepressant medications, you know, you have to work with your doctor on that. We can't really tell you what to do there. Um, but, you know, one possible strategy is to switch to a different medication because different people react differently to different medications. So that's one. And I would honestly suggest that if you can work with your doctor and figure out a way to not have to be on them, that really is your best case scenario. Really, there are a lot of you know things that we would call sort of natural antidepressants, like being out in nature, having the love of friends and family and connection. Increasing your vitamin D levels. Increasing vitamin D levels. Your magnesium levels. Doing things that you love, activities that you love. There's a lot of things that you know we would call natural antidepressants because they make you happy mm -hmm. without having to take a medication. So that's really our recommendation. Now, do not. Do not just stop taking them if you're taking them. Go talk to your doctor and work out a plan to do it safely if that's what you want to do. Let's talk about our step four. We're going to get into the juicy stuff now. So know how your body works. And that's, I'd say like such a common sense one, but yet... Common sense, not so common. <laughs> <laughs> we have to come up with a new term. We can't call it common sense anymore because it's so lacking. It's no longer common. A lot of women expect that one day they'll meet the man who will know how to open up their body and how to make them come into earth shattering orgasms. And here's the news for you, ladies. If that's you, <laughs> that day will probably never come. And neither and will you. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, that day might come. There are scenarios where, you know, a partner can open you up to things that you didn't know about about yourself. But the important point here is do not rely on that. It may happen. It may never happen. The point is you need to know what works for your body. And there's only one way you can really know that. Figure it out for yourself. And that would lead to our step five. Experiments, right? Try stuff on yourself, which number five is start solo. Masturbation, self-pleasure, however you name it. But play with yourself, touch yourself, figure it out. Put the mirror in front of you. Look at what you're doing. Try a different touch. Try with toys, with our toys, with your fingers, standing up, sitting in the shower, in the bathtub. I mean, come on, go in nature if you can. I mean, try all the different things. Yeah, the thing is, is the same thing doesn't work for everybody, especially if you're a woman. This is a little simpler for us guys, but for ladies, it might be, you know, you have to G-spot stimulate or you have to clitoris stimulate or you, some women are like really vigorous clitoral stimulation where others like, whoa, no, that instantly numbs me out, right? Like you have to figure out what works for you. Let's talk about number six, which is about rewiring your brain. Believing is everything. If you believe that you can't come, you are 
right. <laughs> <laughs> if you believe you can, then you can. Whatever you believe is true. And you got to remove these old patterns. You can work with different programs like hypnosis or EFT, but things that will work on the subconscious. What's in your brain is not conscious. So just saying, I can come, I'm a coming machine is not going to change the subconscious. You need to rewire that. Yeah, I think it was Henry Ford who said, whether you believe you can or you can't, either way, you are correct. Mm -hmm, maybe. I don't know if that's him, but the quote is correct. Yeah. Well, and, and so, you know, what we're really talking about here is removing old patterns, right? So in other words, if you've been telling yourself for years, well, I just can't go. Uh, you know, it just doesn't work for me. Or, or another maybe more common thing is I need to have it this way mm -hmm. in order to come, right? Those are, those are belief patterns that you've ingrained in, in your subconscious by repeating them over and over and over again. And as you alluded to, it's the subconscious that really runs the show. 95% of what we do is run by our subconscious. Right. And so by sitting here saying, well, I believe I can come. But without putting that into the subconscious, it's probably, it's not going to override the actual subconscious program, which is no, you can't. And things like self-hypnosis work really well. Things like emotional freedom technique, EFT work awesome. I use all of that in my for myself, in my practice with my clients. Um, so you got to go to the subconscious. It's really important. And your mind is essential there. So we've got to retrain that. Yeah, we're, go we're going to be uh, partnering with some new tools that are going to be able to help you in that area too. That's going to be kind of exciting. We'll, we'll We'll be sharing that out through our email list. So if you're not on our email list, you should go to selenaremy.com forward slash vault, vault and uh, get on that list because we're going to be sharing tools like that that can help you. Number seven, reduce your stress levels. So now we are talking about the biggies that we're not separated, that if you have a high level of stress, it's, it will impact your libido, your ability to have orgasm. And you, you need to find ways to reduce your stress level and reduce your cortisol. Yeah, yeah, stress levels, big time, big time. And if you're a guy, you'll also notice that you'll have, if your stress levels are too high, you'll let often have trouble getting an erection as well. So those two can be tied together. Number eight, practice mindfulness. This is huge. So mindfulness as a practice is the art of being present. And nowadays we are so good at multitasking, especially women. You know, we have this diffuse awareness. We can do multiple things at once and it gets in the way in the bedroom. One of the biggest thing and changes that happened for me was when I learned meditation, I learned transcendental meditation. It impacted my sex life quite quickly and and a lot i was very surprised i did not expect that I already had good sex but it really made a difference and mindfulness is not something you just do in the bedroom it's a new way of living and we challenge you next time you take a shower to to mindfully take a shower and be there feeling the water dripping down your body and the, uh, yourself like just being there or next time you're driving rather than like being listening to other stuff like being present and one with the car and merging with the steering wheel or <laughs> next time you go on a walk i mean you get the gist of it yeah you know uh quantum physicist uh fred allen wolf said years ago he said the the final frontier is not space, as they said in Star Trek, but it's mind. Yeah, so mindfulness. And I think pretty much anyone can benefit from improving and increasing their mindfulness, even if you already have great sex. I want to talk to you about number nine, which is about being present with your sensations and feelings. And that's connected to the mindfulness part. And it's also a little bit different. There is a practice called sensate focus, which if you do sex therapy, if you work with somebody like me, we, we will walk you through this learning to be present with the sensations in your body. So most people are stuck and can't get out of their mind. So they spend time in their head. When you spend time in your head, you can be feeling your body and you usually can't come. Learning to feel the sensations and your feelings will allow you to start to modulate what you're feeling and to get closer to an orgasm. 
Woohoo! <laughs> Celebrate. <laughs> All right. Which one are we on now? We are at um, number 10, 10 now. Ah, yes, number 10. Well, number 10 is relax, which is very similar to reducing stress, but not necessarily. You don't necessarily have to be stressed. You can literally just be busy, like too busy, always doing stuff, right? And therefore, taking time to relax can get you back into your body. And if you get back into your body, you can start to feel things again. If you feel things, you might just have an orgasm. Ah, well, and I love the relaxed part is like, you know, everybody knows they have better sex on vacation, right? Why? Because you are less stressed, you are more relaxed, you don't have a to-do list, and you're more present. You're and- not worried about ejaculating all over the uh, the room, you know, like the, <laughs> the sheets, the walls, whatever. Do not ejaculate <laughs> on the walls or the curtains. It's disgusting. I'm sorry. You've I seen right where that. they take the black light into I like know. hotel rooms and you're like, oh my God, there's cum everywhere. I know. So one thing you're like, who does that? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. They need to watch these things better. <laughs> <laughs> Number 11, know what you want and tell your partner. Again, your partner is not a Jedi mind reader. You can't expect your partner to know what you want, but you have to tell them and things will vary. Yeah, this is huge. And this, this comes back to what did you learn from your experimentation in your masturbation? You figured out what type of touch you like, what part of your anatomy needs to be touched and for how long and all that. You figured that out, right? Now you need to tell your partner. Because if it took you probably 30 years to figure it out, you think they're going to figure it out? (laughs) They might, but it's probably going to take them a while too, right? So especially because, you know, with if it's a guy trying to figure out a woman, she's probably what she needs varies uh, not only in every sex session, but in different moments throughout that, that one session. So he's not a mind reader. Tell him exactly what it is you want. Tell him all the secrets that you figured out. Trust me, it is to your advantage to give him the keys. Uh, By the way, it works both ways because sometimes women are a little too rough with a man's genitals. And you know, that's actually true. And he might need a a softer touch or maybe he wants to be held or maybe he wants a little bit firmer grip. And it's important. Like, don't think that it's just like this up and down motion. That's all the guy wants. You know, that's true because, you know, sometimes when you see see women handling men's penises in porn movies you're like damn you're gonna need a week to recover <laughs> after that like this is actually not really enjoyable at least not for me i mean sometimes a little bit of vigorous is is really good but you watch what they do in some porn movies and you're like no no thanks keep that kung fu grip away from my penis <laughs> <laughs> number 12 i have adequate stimulation so one of the benefits of knowing with your solo practice what you like what you need is also knowing like okay there needs to be enough stimulation so let's just talk about that for a few seconds if you have a vibrator then you're very familiar that you need a constant amount of pressure to get to that orgasm then you can find ways to duplicate it if you can't if it's not like easy you don't or have robo tongue <laughs> exactly then use your vibrator during the love making like whatever is needed uh, but give yourself enough stimulation that also means give yourself enough time like we talked about earlier like while it's fun to come in three minutes it's really not the norm and it's normal to take much longer and i think one of the biggest issue for women is we don't give ourselves enough time to get there and then our heads start to get in the way and be like oh what's wrong i'm taking so long he must be bored i need to come soon like well come on and the more you do that the less you're gonna get there right and so it's important to just be able to give yourself that time give yourself the right stimulation if you need to stimulate your clitoris to have an orgasm just stimulate your clitoris to have an orgasm you know like do what works Um, and there are ways to use that clitoris as a fire stoker to start to create new neural pathways so that other body parts can start to feel orgasmic pleasure too. And that's things that I can help you with. So you can always work with me. 
Yeah, and that leads us straight to the next one, which is don't focus on the destination. So take the pressure off. The problem is, is when people start to have problems orgasming, then the next time they have sex, the first thing that comes into their mind is, oh, I hope I can do it. I hope I can do it. Oh, I got to make this happen. Oh, it hasn't happened in so long. And what if it doesn't happen? Or <laughs> if it takes too long to happen? Or right, and the mind starts going crazy like that. So if you can literally just take that pressure off by saying, you know what? It doesn't matter if it happens at all or not. Right? And that was kind of a big thing with you and oral sex too. Mm. It was like for a period of your life, you were like, I don't really orgasm during oral sex. And so, you know, if the man was going down on you and it was taking too long, you'd start to get in your head about it mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And, you know, so we just took that off the table and said, well, it doesn't matter if you do or not. And don't worry about how long I'll go for as long as I feel like going. And now you orgasm every time. <laughs> That's true. True story. Mm -hmm. True story. Number 14. This is a huge one. Train your pelvic floor muscles. We did a huge show on how to do kegels properly and your pelvic floor muscles. So listen to that show if you want to learn more. But what is an orgasm, but rhythmical contractions of your pelvic floor muscles. And so if you want to feel more sensations, if you have, want to have stronger orgasms, you need to have stronger muscle tones. You don't want to have your muscles to be too tight or to be too uh, loose, if that's the term. You want them weak. to be weak. Thank you. You want them to be toned. And training your pelvic floor muscles can help you. One of the things that I do see is that people don't train their muscles properly. They do kegels. They don't do properly they and then they become hypertonic so the meaning they hold chronic tension and that chronic tension gets in the way mm -hmm. all right last one on our list so you know we started off with the list talking about how if you have underlying health conditions or physical things or you know antidepressants or the problem or whatever to work with your doctor okay awesome then we gave you a whole bunch of things that you can do on your own the very last thing on the list is if you still need help and support to seek the help of professionals, that would be people like us who can help you work through a lot of those things and all those other things in between the medical doctor and where we are now, all those other things on the list. We can help you with all of those. We can, you know, I'm, we're just kind of giving you an idea of what those things are, but we can really work in depth with you to help you really realize those things. And we want to leave you with our last message that remember when it comes to lovemaking, it's about coming with your heart, not just with your genitals. And it changes everything if that's the approach you take in the bedroom. Oh yeah, that that is actually huge. I need my boom sound effect. <laughs> boom. <laughs> Truth bomb, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah, you got physical stuff in the body for sure. You've got mental stuff, but really, I mean, if you really want to have the pinnacle of orgasms, your heart has to be in it mm -hmm. for sure. And if you focus on the heart, the physical stuff don't matter the same because if the physical stuff are not there, you can have heart orgasms, you can have heart connection, intimacy and all of that, which is truly what we seek ultimately. Yeah, we want to have a physical orgasm, but what we want is that feeling of connection with another being, that feeling of dissolving into something that's bigger than us, that feeling of forgetting for a second that we are this limited beings in this limited body. We want to become limitless and, and dissolve into everything that is. Well, the, the heart is the pathway. It mm -hmm. really is. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Well, there you go. We covered a lot of ground in this episode. We hope that that was helpful. If you need more help, as always, please reach out to us. And that's all the time we have for this episode. So we will see you next week. We hope you like this episode of the Love Lab podcast. If you enjoy this show, subscribe, leave us a review, and share it with your friends. And for more free, exclusive content, join us in the Passion Vault at CelineRemy.com forward slash vault. That's C-E-L-I-N-E-R-E-M-Y dot com forward slash vault. Thanks for listening. And remember, you're amazing. <laughs>